So as I was saying earlier, that you know, creating homework, effective homework habits is really invaluable for children and teens with ADHD who tend to struggle with persistent inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. And I could say that you know, whatever we talk about in terms of homework would be also true in some ways for adults for doing you know, unpleasant or unrewarding tasks that relate to work or home or you know, chores and things like that. So um, one of the things that happens is that um, there are obstacles that get in the way for kids and adults with starting, focusing on, and completing homework. And that's why it's really important that parents of kids with ADHD help instill effective homework habits and, pr and, and provide support structures, which can then guide their kids to better outcomes. Kids are ultimately responsible for the heavy lifting of getting their schoolwork done, but parents can set up their child with ADHD for school success by getting them organized, holding them accountable, and provi providing plenty of encouragement along the way. It's never too early to create effective study habits for your kids, and let's look at what this means. So um, your child or teen spends most of their day struggling to stay focused or an accomplished classroom studies. They work hard to keep it together in school. And when school's over, they often need a break from studying or they come home and they kind of like fall apart. They sort of, whatever, whatever they were using to kind of keep themselves together at school, there's sort of a melting that can happen. I'm sure as some of you have seen. Um, and sometimes their brains just need to do something different. And this is directly in contrast to issues around medication, because a medication for kids who take, you know, a stimulant in uh, particular wears off, uh, you know, an extended release stimulant wears off, you know, after, you know, after school, sometimes by four or five. Um, sometimes earlier. And so what happens is they come home from school and they want a break and they probably need a break of some kind, but their medication isn't, is going to leave their brain during their break, which makes doing homework even harder. So we have to really set up a different scenario where you come home, maybe you take a 15 minute break and you have snack, and then you do some of your homework, preferably the hardest part, um, as soon as possible. Many people, including myself, I like to do something easy to warm up and then I can kind of dig into the harder thing and that can be true for your kids. Certainly worth asking them about the order in which they like to do their homework and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I want to greet, uh, uh, let's see, did I greet Jacqueline? I'm not sure. And Maribel and Jamie and Lila. Welcome. So what we want to do is just to help our kids um, you know, transition home and deal with homework and have homework that's actually manageable for them to do rather than impossible for them to do. So the surest way to counter your child's um, you know, uh, uh, forgetfulness or inconsistency or difficulty in focusing on homework is by setting up a routine of study habits followed by an incentive of an activity that they enjoy. Predictability is the key to getting the job done. So when your child has a daily routine for doing homework, they'll have fewer opportunities for procrastination. Um, they will be more motivated and less anxious because they'll know what to expect. I do this, then I do that, then I earn this. And they know that they they'll do their have-to stuff before their want-to stuff. And, and good study habits, of course, go beyond just doing homework at a specific time. It's about setting up meaningful incentives, removing distractions, and enabling focus to achieve the best results. So although you know your child best, it's, it's a collaborative approach that actually works best. So together, we want to facilitate conversations where you talk about your level involvement of involvement in homework based on the reality of what's really getting finished and turned in. Then we want to brainstorm a collaborative plan so that there's more buy-in and a better shot at school success. So I'd love it if people would put into the chat um, where, where homework is going well and where they're struggling. I have a few more people I'd love to greet. Susan, hi. Kari, hi. Darlene. Um, Darlene, you're saying that you feel like a homework 
is ableist. The kids without disabilities get the good grades and the kids who have ADHD are doing four or five hours per night. I completely agree. I have three ADD kids and I can tell you homework does nothing. Maybe we should re-engineer the, the system instead of having this ableist system. Uh, we don't get any breaks at all at my house, no family times, even on the weekend. Oh, that sounds really hard. And Dar Darlene, I wanna talk to you about this because every family needs a break. You need to have some play time. So why well, I mean, you could tell me what's getting in the way of having any breaks on the weekends. Hi Priya, hi uh, Maria from uh, uh, Cumbria, UK and Priya is from Sweden, great. So I want to know, um, let's talk first about where your child is around homework. Where, what's hard about homework, where they get stuck, where you get stuck. So three questions, what's hard about homework, where they get stuck and where you get stuck. Uh, Emer, um, let's see, Emer says, uh, not so great. Um, Susie says math for my girls is maths for my girls tricky. Emer, not so great. Just found out my son age 10 has dyslexia. So I will totally have to revamp his homework. We can talk about that. Crystal says homework takes so long. It's overwhelming to our kids and takes their whole night and weekend for her to do what other kids can do in an hour and a half. Uh, Gemma, homework is always left until last second because gaming is getting in the way. Schools don't communicate even after several meetings. So I want to say something about uh, how long homework should take. So if the expectation, we want to get a sense from the teachers, what is the normal, n quote unquote, normal expectation for this homework? Like what, is, what are you, how much time are you expecting a student to spend on the homework? And if the amount of time you're expecting the student to spend on the homework is an hour and a half, then that's all your child has to spend on the homework. If they don't get it done, then there needs to be a, a school meeting with some changes and accommodations made to the homework uh, situation, because it's not fair for your child who's neurodivergent to spend five hours doing homework that takes a neurotypical kid an hour and a half. If the amount of time expected for a 10 year old to do homework is an hour and a half, then it should be an hour and a half, regardless if you're um, neurodivergent or neurotypical. And this means actually having some meetings with the school and making sure your rights or your child's rights are being uh, attended to. Math also has ADHD. My daughter does not have ADD, although can accomplish the same workload much quicker. Jamie, ADD parent helping the ADD ch child having a hard time with consistency. Right. So Jamie, this is it's great that you shared this. So what we want to talk about in situations like this, when a parent has ADHD and a child has ADHD, is setting up routines, routines that work. So how much time, when, where, um, what your role is going to be, you know, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. So what we wanna start with is figuring out the when, where, how, and what of the homework. So where is the homework gonna be done? And I am a big advocate of what I call family work time. So your child is at a common table, a dining room or kitchen table. You're in that area or you're also working at the table on stuff you have to do. So everybody's present doing stuff. That way you're available to answer questions. You're also available to check in and make sure they are doing their homework. Uh, one of my uh, clients used to have his kids sit, um, put his, his, his computer um, and his chair at, at, in front of a window. So when the computer was open, the father could look in the window and see what his child was doing. Was he was he actually doing the homework or was he on a social media site? And and that he was able to sort of be present without being intrusive and say, hey, you know what? I just want to check in. Let's see what you're doing and where you are. And then he would be able to manage that. So we want to figure out, like, when does homework occur? How long should homework be? You know, and um, or, you know, what is the process of doing homework in your families? So the first thing we want to think about is creating an incentive-based system for doing homework with your child or teen. And start by figuring out how long they can actually work before becoming distracted. So, you know, is it 15 minutes and then they need a two-minute break and then they can do another 15 minutes, but then they need a five-minute break? You know, what is the sum total amount of time? And then what are the chunks that where they can actually do a piece of work before they start to wander, before they get distracted or angry or upset? 
And of course, some of that can be related to the subject matter, but it is important to understand how long they can actually, you know, focus and concentrate before they need a break. Then the next thing we want to do is ask about the order that they want to approach their homework and why. You know, there's stuff that kids like and stuff that kids don't like, stuff that's easy for them and stuff that's hard for them. We as adults are the same way. Some of us like to start by doing something easy to warm up and then tackle the hard thing and finish with the medium task. Some people like to start with something medium, do something easy and then end with the hard task. We want to understand what is easy, medium, and hard for your child and how they want to approach the work. And this also, you know, has to do with, you know, the issue of medication. So if, you know, they come home from school and they have a 15-minute snack and a little bit of time to, to, you know, shoot some hoops or whatever, then they have a period where they do homework. Um, often we want them to have a little bit of a sense of success and then tackle that hard thing while the medicine is still in their brains. So we wanna set up a plan for a total studying um, time that includes establishing work periods for the amount of time that they can actually concentrate in the order that they prefer. Then we wanna break up these timed periods with short breaks of no more than five minutes um, and we can use a timer for this. Uh, the time timer is a great tool. Um, the uh, Pomodoro method or the tomato timer or um, a watch or a phone or just a regular old fashioned timer that you set, um, these can all be useful. And then, so you have a timer for the study period and then you have a timer for the break period. And these breaks can include a little snack, going to the bathroom, petting the dog, maybe doing some jumping jacks, something that is you know, not on the screen or at the homework. This is your map and the beginning of a routine that you're creating for doing homework. Longer breaks with bigger rewards occur when whatever goal you've set for the studying period in total is finished. So let's see what you guys have to say. I'm curious what you think about that and let's see what other people have to say. Uh, Charlotte, we struggle to get the homework off the ground as my son has beliefs that he doesn't have to do it. It's not important. He reacts strongly. I think it feels overwhelming. When we get to the point, I can walk him through it. We're okay. So we might want to budget in, Charlotte, time for the protest. So, you know, you, you need to sort of sit down, with, sit down with him in a calm moment and say, okay, so when it's time to do homework, there's like 15 minutes of protesting. So I'm going to add that in to the amount of time we need you know, because you're, you're frustrated, it's hard to sort of settle. Um, so let's just put that in, that that's gonna be there. We're not gonna fight about it. We're just gonna know it's there. And then we're gonna structure things after that. Susie, learning tables, e.g. trying to lose, use table fables to utilize visual memory. So this sounds like this is very challenging. Um, and again, when kids with ADHD are doing things that are hard for them, hard for their brain, they naturally have less dopamine, so they're less motivated and they don't feel a sense of reward or satisfaction when they're finished. It's just like, oh, thank God, you know, it's over, I'm done. It's so, it's so terrible in the now that the not now when I'm finished doesn't even matter. So um, if, if, if you're, you know that your child struggles with visual, has vi with visual memory or maybe is, ha uh, has dyslexia or dyscalculia, we want to keep the, the work for those things that are where they have learning um, disabilities limited and ideally done at school with learning support um, educators or aides in place. But if they're coming home, then we want, um, we want to make sure that you're collaborating with the school so you're following the same messages and giving the same messages to your kids that they're receiving at school. Um, and they may have less patience for some of these um, areas um, when they have homework. So we want the homework sort of structured accordingly. And that's something to talk about with the school. So, you know, there should be some accommodation. Instead of doing 15 math problems, maybe you do 10. Um, some kids like to be timed. I want to do my math problems in 10 minutes. Work for 10 minutes, take a break. Some kids just want to do problems. I'll do five problems, then I'll run around the living room, then I'll do five more. So we want to talk with our kids about what makes sense to them. 
Susan says, I remember studying so long, but it wouldn't sink in. Does that make sense? Sure. So that has to do with working memory or processing challenges. Um, many kids with ADHD have slower processing. It, you know, it just takes them a little while longer to sort of chew and absorb and sort through information. Many, many kids have, with ADHD have working memory issues and working memory is like the computational space in the brain. And so what happens is, you know, information comes in and then you have to figure out what to do with it and where to send it. And um, when children struggle with working memory, the information often isn't held long enough in, the, in that uh, working memory to go on to long-term memory or to, to decide, oh, this isn't really that important. It just doesn't hang out in that space. So kids can't really transfer it and then they're struggling. Maria, my daughter is 13 and homework has always been a battle. Homework often is a battle for kids with ADHD and it may not get better for a long time and it may never really change. Like they can become adults who are like, you know, I have to have a job where I don't have to bring it home kind of a thing. Priya says, it's hard to sit and write. As long as it's just reading or math, it goes good, but writing is difficult. So thank you for bringing this up, Priya. Writing uses all of your executive functioning skills simultaneously, which is why so many kids and adults with ADHD struggle with written expression. Um, it has to, you have to organize, you have to plan, you have to prioritize, you have to use impulse control and um, sustained attention and focus and working memory. It's using everything together. And so um, one, one of the things that we want to help kids with ADHD do when they struggle with writing is, is work with their teachers on whatever kinds of writing tools or maps or pictorial aids they're using with their kids in class so that you could then use them also at home. That's, it's a very important that it's kind of, kind of a same, same situation. And some kids with ADHD do better talking their ideas, particularly younger kids, and having you scribe for them initially. Um, sometimes they can use talk to speech um, programs. Those can be very helpful. But the actual act of writing, particularly if it's with a pencil, a lot of kids with ADHD have dysgraphia. So learning how to keyboard can be very helpful. Um, Tanya, if you are usually ADHD or ADD, uh, usually are you just have do you have dyscalculia or dyslexia no about 60 70 percent of kids with 80 with adhd have some kind of learning um disability um, but it can vary the percentages can vary uh, goldie fourth grade math is a huge struggle fourth grade multi-step math problems are so difficult i try to help but she also often gets defensive so one thing that could help goldie is breaking down a multi-step math problem in into different parts and i would meet with the teacher to do that like if there's four steps to a program to a problem you know can you do one and two and then pause and then do three and four how does she figure out what steps one and two are where's the example of how to do this like we have to help them break things down um, otherwise it, it's too overwhelming lila struggling in math science and english maribel what works is having a schedule for homework what doesn't work is when he needs to to do a redo of homework and it's not in our plan. I'm curious what what brings about a redo of homework, because ideally you want to have him do the homework and then turn it in and let the teacher see how he's working so that they can then make sure that that he's getting the aid that he needs. Crystal, it's very hard for her to break down tasks, especially long assignments, and they come up quickly on her and then it is a massive overwhelm. She also says that her brain works better when there is a pressing deadline and she focuses better somehow then versus other times when she tries to whittle it away ahead in smaller chunks. Any uh, suggestions from me? So this is a really interesting question because what you're talking about is that she has some ideas of what works for her and what doesn't. And so a lot of people with ADHD do work better when there's a pressing deadline and they can focus because what happens is it's a stress, the, the, the deadline is sort of pushes the cortisol and the adrenaline into the brain. So it's a stress a reaction and, um, you know, it's, it's a sort of a, a you know, an increased 
um, you know, epinephrine and a sympathetic nervous system. And then, whoa, they can focus because they have they have no time and they're sort of in fight, flight or freeze. So, um, you know, we might want to talk about is her experience of what it's like when she's on a pressing deadline, because usually it's hard for kids when they're on that kind of deadline. It doesn't feel good. It, mo it They feel motivated because they have this thing that they have to meet. Um, and what we might want to do is kind of set up two deadlines, you know, like a part one deadline and a part two deadline. And that can be very useful for kids uh, with ADHD um, who are struggling. So I do have a link for you uh, for a downloadable gift on um, homework. I'm just trying to find it for you. Here we go. Um, no, uh, this was... Um, uh, hmm. I'm just trying to find this for you. So this was from a workshop I gave. Um, and um, that I did this fall on building better brains. It was about managing homework with ADHD. So I'm gonna put this handout here for you. And um, did that work? Let me see. Not sure if that worked. Hold on a second. Uh, no, it did not work. So let me try that again. Sorry about that. Here we go. I'm gonna copy this so I can give it to you. Here we go. There you go. So that's a handout on, um, you know, sort of avoiding the homework hassle. Okay, so let's go back. Um, Joel says, it's hard because he's been doing school all day. That's exactly right. However, he can't finish classwork in class due to distractions, so it becomes homework, it never ends. So, you know, um, if he can't finish classwork in class due to distractions, you know, really that's kind of the school's issue. And we wanna go back to the school and say, you know, my son isn't able to concentrate in class due to distractions. You know, what can we do at school to facilitate him being in a situation where he's less distracted to do his work? You know, does he need to go to the library? Does he need to be, have, um, you know, things set up around his desk? What would help him or her in school? Anna, it's always a battle. My one son has ADHD, dyslexia, and dyscalculia, and autism. My other son has ADHD and anxiety. I also have ADHD and work full time. I don't get home from work until six. By then, everyone is starved and exhausted. Then we are expected to spend 20 minutes per subject per night. Their grades are based off of homework assignments. Ugh, that seems so unfair, Anna. So, you know, I think that by the time you get home, everybody does need food and some nutrient, you know, some, some time together at the dinner table. And then I would do family work time where you're all together and you're there supporting them and available to answer questions and guide them through the situation. Gemma, my daughter struggles to complete a tests and assessments due to massive anxiety. Well, we know that anxiety travels for kids with ADHD um, together with ADHD around 34% of the time. I see more than that, but that's what the statistics are in terms of the diagnosis. So the, you know, the anxiety will, will make it harder to do work because it's harder to focus when you're feeling anxious. Maria, I totally agree. I used to spend ages with my daughter doing homework, missing out in life. Now she's 13 and I finally had learned that she's not academic and she deserves to have a life. So my expectations are much healthier now and she seems much happier too. That's awesome. Crystal mine as well. Test results are also much lower due to this and focus is a challenge with tests. Right. So if they're struggling with focus with tests, you know, what, what is the, what is the plan going to be at school? There needs to be a plan. Um, for kids who are neurodivergent learners. And if there's not a plan, then we have to figure out what the law is for around special education for these students and um, how you can um, get someone to help you advocate. Uh, Colleen asks, what about kids who are not on medication? Um, well, for kids who are not on medication, um, they still need to come home and they need a break, but you don't wanna give them, too, again, too long a break because the more that their brain gets tired, the less able they'll be able to focus on the homework. I worked with someone that basically, she was like in fifth grade and the mom's like, she comes home, she plays for like two hours and then we have to do homework and it's a battle every night. And I said, that's because she's getting the want to before the have to, right? 
you can have like a little bit of time to hang out and run around and play maybe a half hour. And then we're going to do some homework so that you can earn more free time doing something that you're also interested in. And so this is where we set up the incentive based program. Crystal, my daughter is on extended release medicine and it seems to have worn off after school homework time. That happens a lot. Um, is there a way to do some homework during school when they're when they are eight, when they, when the medication is still working? Priya, if I get my if my son gets a break in the middle of homework, it's difficult for him to continue again. That also happens with kids. Some kids prefer that kind of hyper focus energy. I'm just going to plow through it. Um, but um, and and that can be um, that can be useful. Uh, there are challenges with hyper focus. Some of the challenges with hyper focus is the depletion of the brain's glucose centers, which is like the food for the brain. So they're focusing, they're focusing, and they're not taking a break, and they can't really integrate. So one of the things that helps is having some sort of notes or you, you know, type out whatever is in your brain before you do the homework and you, you keep the break short and timed. And then there's an incentive when the homework is over that's earned because they got back to the work itself. Thank you for sharing about the Pomodoro method. Emer, can you explain more about incentives, please? Yes. So um, incentives are things that kids are interested in doing, they want to do. This could be playing a game of cards with you. This could be earning their video time, their computer time. This could be um, uh, watching some television. This could be, um, you know, basically having a band rehearsal with their friends. You know, it depends on what matters to your kid. It could be baking brownies together with you. So you want to kind of sit down with them in a calm moment and get a sense of what the um, uh, what the what the thing what the what things really would motivate them. What's a reward for them when they finished something that's unpleasant for them? So let's take a few minutes and go over my second tip. So my first tip is to create an incentive-based system for doing homework with your child or teen. The second tip is to go over the homework assignments before starting and or check in when the work is over. So some kids, a lot of kids who have executive functioning challenges have trouble getting started. So we want to review the homework together. Just maybe, you know, what do you have? Um, perhaps how long is it going to take? In my book, I have a chart that you can use to sort of help plan out homework. Um, so we want to sort of get a sense of what you're trying to do and set up your, your, your homework period. And then at the end of the period, you want to make sure that the work is actually submitted. And so that's, again, the benefit of that family work time. You're there and, you know, you can just say, hey, did you press submit? Because a lot of kids don't press submit. And so then they do the homework and it doesn't, they don't get credit for it. So we really want to make sure that they press submit. And some kids will be like, oh, don't tell me what to do. I don't want you to remind me. And that's okay. But you want to basically say, I'm concerned because one of the things I've heard from your teachers is that you don't turn your work in. And so all I'm doing is, is cueing you to turn the work in. That's it. This is not, not a reminder machine. I'm not a nag. I'm just basically saying, let's make sure you press submit. And when that's happening regularly, I don't have to remind you and I will stop. So um, uh, you can also um, put the worksheets in the backpack if some of the things are things that they're working on with a pencil and, and, and a piece of paper. It's nice to have homework be some on the computer and some actual physical, you know, something they're reading or underlining, or they're actually doing a worksheet, you know, having everything be on the computer is very difficult for kids with ADHD. And it also is kind of monotonous and boring. So we want to kind of shake it up a little bit with some diversity. So when your child has finished all these things, now they earn the privilege or reward that you've chosen together. And for one family, that reward could be a show of television or a specific amount of gaming time. For another, it could be playing, you know, some soccer in the backyard. And for a third, it could be reading a story together on the sofa. Whatever works for your family and is meaningful for your child is a good choice. You know, I can't tell you what these things are. And remember that kids with ADHD naturally get bored with certain rewards or routines. So you may have to upgrade upgrade or change things, you know, maybe one month we do this and then another month we do that or even less than a month. 
Okay, so let's see. Thank you for sharing about slow processing speed and working memory. Um, Maria, today my daughter had done an English exam with a laptop, which really helped. Fantastic. Thank you, Melanie, about that. Bad handwriting, is that ADHD too? Um, I wouldn't say yes or no to that. I just think that many people with ADHD have dysgraphia um, and because uh, it's a motoric issue, so we can see that happening. Um, Taylor is 31. Hi, Taylor. And I have ADHD. I can't seem to finish my schooling. I'm a hands-on learner. If something is written and I need to learn it, I can't remember what I read. It seems like I struggled in school. I worry about my kids. Of course you do. So um, there are lots of things that we can do. And, and, and Melanie um, posted an article on building working memory. Um, there are online tools. Um, we can also use um, helpers for ourselves, whether it's like, you know, uh, a, a sort of taking a note as you're reading, you know, learning how to highlight the important, you know, the one important sentence in each paragraph, um, maybe using a little post uh, on the side to mark something that really matters to you. Rebecca, how do you deal with the embarrassment of not being able to do homework quickly when younger siblings have no problem finishing up quickly and everything is easy for them. So this is very difficult for harder for older siblings, harder siblings. For older siblings, when their younger siblings are neurotypical and get through homework quite quickly and they're struggling to finish their own homework. Um, and I think the important thing that we want to say, we would, I would want to say in a family is, you know, younger kids have different kinds of homework and you're older, so your homework is a little more challenging and may take more time. It doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. It just means different kinds of homework and different kinds of brains and to try to normalize it as much as possible. Um, Heather, if a child tests negative for the Vanderbilt assessment, but parents still feel they show significant ADHD, particularly in attentive types of systems, what can our next steps be? Uh, that's a very good question, Heather. You are, if you live in the United States, I know that you are entitled to an evaluation. If you can fill out forms through um, uh, the pupil services or the special education department, you know, you have that right. And so um, you might want to get a full, uh, you know, um, psychoeducational uh, evaluation for your child if you're concerned. And um, you have the schools need to comply with your request. Um, they may push back, but that is I believe that is the law. And I would check on that. Uh, OK, thank you. Parents, praise the baby steps. It helps. Susan, I could not agree with you more. Like that is so important to be able to notice, to validate the small chunks. Cause you know, one of the things that helps with getting started is breaking things down into small doable steps. Many kids with ADHD don't get started because they don't feel like they're actually ever gonna finish or they can finish. So we wanna break it down into something that they feel like they can do and then they feel good about doing. Um, Susie says, no support at school, ADHD diagnosis, but doesn't have a diagnosis of dyslexia, although me and her dad do. School is using a virtual learning environment for arithmetic with personalized avatars and coins as rewards. The kids are hacking and spending each other's coins. I'm sourcing funny, engaging texts to get her hooked into her books, which is working well. Hmm. That is really challenging. It's interesting that they're using this sort of virtual thing for math because it seems to me that math is something that you can do somewhat virtually, but also, you know, to, to do it, um, you know, with more tactile tools would be helpful. Uh, it sounds like you're supporting your child. I don't understand why there's no support at school. And, you know, you might um, uh, be able to, uh, again, get an, an, an outside assessment of um of of the, her of her uh reading um of her reading skills um and uh perhaps um you know a tutor as well crystal those pressing deadlines lead to high stress knowing it is not being worked on ahead of time and avoid which hangs over her but then she focuses and gets it done so much better when it is last minute but often runs out of time to complete the whole assignment or will stay up all night which is unhealthy and throws off 
from moving forward. Right. So, so essentially, this is very hard for being a, for for kids who sort of in some ways that this. Um, last minute thing is serving them because they are focused, they get it done, and then they know they will. But the problem is all the anxiety and the stress before they actually work on it. So we've got to try to break something down and have other deadlines other than one deadline, which isn't really going to help. You're welcome. M Maria, I feel like there's a massive lack of understanding of ADHD from teachers and only send teachers get the training. Um, I would say that I think a lot of people who are educators believe they understand ADHD and it's so like over, like we don't need to talk about it, we get it. And that's not what I'm seeing at all in my practice or my trainings. So let me go to my third tip, which is family work time. So this means you work alongside your child or your teen to make sure that work is actually getting done and to answer any questions they might have. So we want to use the opportunity to catch up on your own work, your bills, or your Facebook. You're there for their support and gentle guidance. And that way, your presence will also help your kids, especially those with learning or attention challenges, to stay on track. Because it's harder to really kind of veer off from the, the, the task at hand when your parent is sitting at the same table. The fourth tip is to let their work be their own. Avoid comments about how they can do things differently or better. Leave corrections to their teachers. Your job is to provide a supportive, consistent environment to do the homework. Their teacher needs to see an accurate level of your child's work to assess how they are really doing. And if your child is struggling, they'll be able to catch this. And this is very hard for a lot of parents who want to help their kids you know, learn how to write or do something differently or more effectively. But I would encourage you, you know, to keep that limited, um, you know, agree, set, set, set an agreement with your child about how long you're willing to do that or how much, and then send it back to the school. Um, the fifth tip is notice what is going well. Make a point of casually noticing when your child is cooperating with the homework plan and doing their work cooperate, you know, you know, co collaboratively and um, use specific praise and validating statements. Notice their efforting as well as their accomplishments. Maybe they couldn't finish all of their math problems, but they really tried and did most of it. You want to encourage their efforts so they'll keep trying in the future. All right, let's see some of these comments here. My son is 12 years old and he has ADHD and, and um, he's extremely smart and excels at his work when he applies himself. His eight, so he has combined type, it looks like ADHD because he is inattentive and it looks like hyperactive impulsive. So his ADD, his inattentive ADHD, however, has made him the disruption in every class uh, to the point that that would probably be more um, I can't tell if that's his impulsivity or not, so I'm going to take that back. Uh, in every class to the point that he gets put out on a regular basis. I'm reaching out to the school to get a 504 plan. Any suggestions on what I should ask for to help him? Yes. Um, he needs to, um, to have some, also a behavioral plan in place. So he needs a 504 and a behavioral plan. Um, because what, you know, sending him out of class each time is not actually working for him. It's not teaching him any skills. So he needs to learn some skills about impulse control. And, um, and that would mean that would include having signals. Um, so he does need a, a behavioral plan and a 504. You're welcome, Susie. Okay, thanks for sharing that article, Melanie. That's fantastic. How to stand up for your child's education. Great. Colleen, I took my sixth grader, I took my sixth grader 4.5 hours for an assignment. The teacher said it's disheartening to hear it took her that long for an assignment that should take no more than 45 minutes. I'm breathing. I want to say ouch. That's really inappropriate. So um, that's a conversation that need you know that needs a follow-up. Um, and maybe it's an email. Um, or a conversation, but to say, you know, um, when you said this, I felt very concerned and frustrated uh, because it showed me that really you don't understand a lot about uh, neurodivergent kids. And um, 
he was sort of dismissive. And the reality is my child needs help. So what can you do that would help us, please? Um, because if it should only take 45 minutes and it's taking 4.5 hours, then there's something wrong with how, how, with how this assignment is being conveyed or you know, my child needs a different kind of support or breakdown or some pre-teaching about the homework. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, all right. So then, um, again, we are um, we want when we're, when we're talking about noticing what's going well, we are using specific praise and validating statements. We're noticing their efforting as well as their accomplishments. Um, um, maybe they couldn't finish all of their math, but they really tried and they did most of it. You want to encourage their efforts, you know, to notice what they're doing so they can come back and keep trying. This is how we foster a growth mindset. And I know I said this a little bit before I, I did some of the comments, but I'm coming back to it because it is so important. Um, you know, researchers, uh, Dr. Barbara Fredrickson and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania did a bunch of research on positive psychology and happiness. And they found that the ideal positive ratio should be three positives for every negative. And I have worked with people in the, you know, since I, before I wrote my book and since then, and I ask wherever I go, what do you think is the typical ratio for one positive statement? How many negatives do you think you know, your child or your or your students who are, have ADHD here. So let's write that down in the comments. What do you think the ratio is for every positive, how many negatives? Because it is not gonna be three positives for every negative for any of your kids, because it doesn't work that way. It's maybe one positive for 10, 15, 20 negative comments. And then when kids who are older add in what they say to themselves, it's even higher sometimes 30 or 40. So um, this means that kids, your kids need to hear from you validation and encouragement about what they're doing well, because that they're not, that's not what they're getting and that's not what they're telling themselves. And that builds, you know, of course, this leads to shame and low self-esteem. And finally, we want to focus on teaching executive functioning skills. So we want to, we want to support the growing independence of kids by leaning into their executive functioning strengths and shoring up their challenges. So pick one, maybe two weaker skills that are related to school um, to work on together. Meet with a teacher and say, let's pick something that's challenging for you and we're going to work on it at school, see how it manifests and work on it at school. And then we're going to work on it at home by seeing how it manifests at home. This way, this one skill will start to get some, some regular scaffolding and support so that it moves into something that becomes you know, more of a habit that um, it's that they feel it's strengthened. And then that can, you know, then they can move on to working on something else. We want your child to have a say in what this is, because when they have a say in what matters, they have more buy in and greater participation. And that's true for the homework plan in general. So often homework battles are exhausting for your kids and for you. And parents think the most important thing is to get the homework done. And actually the most important thing is to manage a positive connection with your child. So they feel like you're their ally, their ally, excuse me. So they feel like you're their ally, not their taskmaster. Of course you want to help them get things done, but if they are really resisting doing the work and they're arguing with you constantly about it, talk to the school and get additional support, whether it's you know uh, uh, an older student at the school or a college student who can come by and sit with your child two or three times a week and do the homework for an hour that's not you, whether it's a 504 or an IEP or an, a, a psychoeducational evaluation, get things um, that, that your child needs in place. And, and I wanna encourage you, do not be afraid to be the squeaky wheel. The squeaky wheel is gonna get the services. So um, 
when their kids are refusing to do homework, when they're protesting, when they're having tantrums, um, when they're avoiding it, there's often something else going on rather than just refusal. There may be a, a, a sense that I'm going to fail again, or I hate doing this, and the, 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 the experience of doing it this is so unpleasant, I can't even begin to think about what it would be like to be on the other side of it. So it's, it's hard. So then we have to continue to make the task smaller so it's approachable. Or sometimes it's perfectionism. If I can't get it exactly right, I'm not going to do it at all. So we want to get a sense of what's going on behind the scenes for your kids in the protesting, in the refusing, in the avoiding. So that then we can work on those issues rather than engage in the arguments that actually delay doing the work even more. So um, I'm gonna wrap up in a minute or two. If, you, if anyone has any final questions or comments about homework, that would be great. And yes, Colleen, this is being recorded and is available to rewatch. Um, does anyone have any questions about your particular homework struggle um, that you would like to ask me before we stop? 